Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. If you'd like to stay connected with us outside of today's digital broadcast, be sure and download our free mobile app for your smartphone. Through the app, you can watch more of Dr. Dodd's sermons, read daily devotions, access our Bible reading plan, and so much more. To download this free app, just open the App Store on your smartphone and search for Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. We hope this app is an encouragement to you and that using it will help you grow in your relationship with Christ. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy this episode of Higher Aim. Today is going to be a good day because we're here in God's house together. And I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to... Uh, the book of Acts. And in Acts 14, we're going to look at a very interesting passage today because it speaks to us with great power and speaks to us right at our deep, well, not just at a deep, but at our deepest needs, what we really need. In fact, uh, you know, there's been all kinds of surveys as to uh, what people feel they need. Some say, well, I just need more money. And then, you know, some would say, I just need more time. Others say, I need organization and consistency. I need to set personal goals. And then there are others who would say, "I, I need good health. But honestly, those are all surface needs. And today we're going to dive in to what I would describe as deeper heartfelt needs that all believers need. Why don't you follow along with me as I begin to read to you in Acts chapter 14 verse 21 all the way through 28. Here's what the scripture says. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Now, this story is a a great story, for within it, it describes the greatest needs that we have. Now, you see that Paul and Barnabas now have completed this missionary journey. They had ended up planting churches among the Gentiles, and now they are back home to the, uh, from the very place that they had started in Antioch. And, and you know, the Scripture says, the very first place that the Christians were called Christians happened to be at Antioch. However, in this passage, you're going to notice that there are multiple things that every believer needs. I don't care how long you have been in the faith, how long you have been a follower of Jesus. I don't care how many churches you've been a member of, how many times you've read the Bible through, how many translations you have read it through, or honestly, how many scripture verses you have memorized or how many times you have taught a Sunday school lesson or served in the church. These things that I'm about to share with you describe the greatest needs that all believers have. In fact, let me take a quick survey. How many of you, you gave your life to Jesus when you were under the age of 12? Would you raise your hand? Look at all those hands. 
That tells us that children's ministry is very important. How many of you were teenagers when you gave your life to Christ? Great. How many of you, you were in your 20s when you got saved? Great. How about when you were in your 30s? Wow. 40s? 50s? 60s? 70s? 70s? 80s? 80s? Any 80s up there? Raise it real high. You know, you saw many people cheering when they were young, they came to faith. And the longer you wait, the harder it is to come to Christ. But regardless of when you have come to Christ, I need to tell you, you will always have these particular needs in your heart and in your life. Here they are. First, we need to be strengthened. That is a key thought here. And in verse 22, that's exactly what Paul and Barnabas did. They were strengthening the believers. In fact, it comes from this word strengthening, eparizo. And literally it means to reestablish, support, to further, to confirm, to beef up, if you will. In fact, in Philip's translation, it is uh, translated, put a fresh heart into the disciples. And that's exactly what they were doing for these believers. They were there investing in the lives of these followers of Jesus and encouraging them, strengthening them to help them get going again. In fact, that's what the church is about, if you will, to help strengthen believers in Christ. There's an old Chinese proverb that goes like this. If you are planning for a year, plant grain. If you are planning for a decade, plant trees. If you're planning for a century, plant men and women. That's a very powerful statement. Goethe said, treat people as if they were what they ought to be and to help them become what they are capable of being. And that's exactly what Paul and Barnabas were doing. And by their physical presence, just being there, being real and caring, they were strengthening the believers in these different locations where they had planted churches. And they verbalized that uh, as well. But nothing is more powerful than being there. You know, the, the, the movement of Christianity is a Middle East religion, as you know. And as they were moving west, they knew that. And what was happening was, instead of just sending out a text message or an email or a letter, they sent some of their best men. And, and exactly that's what we need. Sometimes we just need people to be in our lives, to be there, to be real. And that's exactly what Paul and Barnabas needed. I pray that you would realize that God uses real individuals to strengthen other individuals. You know, that's why it's important for you to come to church. That's why it's important for you to be involved in a small group Bible study, because your presence is not only a ministry of attendance, if you will, but a ministry of strengthening other people. The power of any body of believers happens to be the power of presence, God's people being in the lives and encouraging other people. We need people in our lives, amen? That is very, very important. We have a tendency to lose our way when we don't have other people involved in our lives. I, I, I've got to tell you that uh, looking back on where we have come from during the, the COVID uh, scenario, I, I have a firm conviction that uh, unless it is an absolute emergency, emergency, we will never shut this church down ever again. 
You know why? Because we need each other. You go, well, we need to uh, guard our health. Yes, but let me tell you something. We need each other, and that is very important. That's where the strength came from. Paul and Barnabas pouring their lives into to these men who were brand new believers. Some were mature believers, but most of them were brand new believers, and they needed the presence of these men of God in their life to strengthen them. You and I, when we look back on our lives as believers, we often think about churches we attended where we learn the word, but honestly, who we really think about are men and women who poured their lives into us and taught us some of the basics of Christianity and challenged us. I, I still remember ladies from VBS uh, when I was uh, a young kid going to church and being challenged to memorize Scripture. I see the faces of those teachers even when, when I was uh, younger than 10. I remember them because they poured their life into me. Uh, I don't remember many sermons, uh, just like you, that I have ever heard. But man, do I remember the people who were in my life that, that strengthened me by their presence and by their words. That's what every believer needs. And if you're feeling, uh, as a believer, you're, you're not up to par, let me just tell you something. You need to be part of the family of faith, and you need to intersect your life and do whatever you can do to find people in your life that will strengthen you and just be there in your life to challenge you, to uh, encourage you, to speak words of grace over you, and to pray for you. That's important. And that's what the Scripture says. I would also tell you that there is another key thing that every believer will always need in their lives, not only to be strengthened, but we need to be encouraged, encouraged. There's a big difference between strengthening someone and encouraging someone. One uh, happens to, to be uh, recharged, another happens to be, uh, well, just giving words that say, keep on, keep on, just keep on keeping on. Uh, if you remember the, uh, that saying from the 60s, keep on trucking, that's exactly the mentality here. And every believer literally needs to be encouraged. If we're not encouraged, what's going to happen? We'll become discouraged. And God wants us to have people in our lives who encourage us. And we need to be people in the lives of other people to encourage them. We, we need to have uh, the truth said to us. In fact, the words for encouragement here are very important that I'm going to share with you in a moment, but I want you to see something. These words of encouragement uh, are, uh, are not flattery. Here's what they say. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. You go, that's encouragement? It's going to get tough? Well, what they were saying, they were giving them realistic encouragement because there would be a season where Christians would be attacked and martyred, and they would need to be standing firm regardless. It's been said that the blood of martyrs produced uh, a harvest uh, of followers, that everywhere uh, a drop of blood from a Christian martyr fell, believers sprung up left and right. And what they did for these believers in these different locations was not to give them false or fake uh, presumption. 
but they were giving realistic encouragement. That there was no sappy or, or uh, false hopes or pop psychology. It was literally saying, hang in there. It's not going to be easy, but the kingdom of God is worth it. And that's what they heard. And they told them, literally, it's not going to be easy to follow Jesus. But God is, God, following God is more important than anything else in the world. And staying in love with Jesus is everything. You have got to hang in there. Those are words of encouragement. You know, a lot of believers think that, uh, that once you say yes to Jesus, it's going to all be downhill. It's just going to be easy. That's, uh, that's fake. Uh, that's wishful thinking that you would just get momentum and just keep on following the Lord. But the truth is, your life as a believer is going to be like a roller coaster. There are going to be some ups and there's going to be some downs. But let me tell you something, God's in charge. And it's important for believers in this generation to know that just like the first generation that followed Jesus it's not going to be easy. In fact, I will tell you, I believe it's going to get harder and harder to be a follower of Christ. As things uh, begin to heat up and more persecution uh, rises, uh, it's going to be difficult. You know, on one hand, we have false churches who have embraced a secular doctrine of liberalism and, and culturalism. And at the same time, moral values have flipped, if you will. But in the midst of all that, believers who are real believers need to understand that it may not be easy, but your eyes are to be on Christ. Let me tell you something. That, that encouragement to keep on keeping on is very powerful. Now, there was a business survey done years ago that found out that 48% of their salesmen uh, would make one call and then quit. Then 25% would make two calls on clients and then stop. 15% would reach out to their clients three times and then quit. Only 12% kept on calling. You know what they also found out? That the 12% who kept on calling accounted for 80% of their business. Now, you go, well, what does that have to do with Christianity? I tell you what, it has everything to do with Christianity, that you and I are just to keep on keeping on. Your witness during the good times and the bad times is very, very important. Your ability to sustain your commitment to Christ, which is honestly sustained by him, not you, is critical. And so, therefore, you need to hear that. In fact, the word for encouragement in this passage there in verse 22 comes from the Greek word uh, parakaleo, which means, well, it means to call, invite invoke, to give consolation, to be of good comfort. It is the very root word for the name of the Holy Spirit, who is the paraclete, one who comes alongside of another. That's what it means to, to be an encourager, one who comes alongside another person. In fact, Believers come no closer to the work of the Holy Spirit than when they come alongside another believer and encourage them to keep on keeping on. Maybe that's why you're here today, because you need not only to be strengthened, but you know you need encouragement. In fact, I, I will tell you that we need encouragement, not just when things are going good, but especially when things are going tough. We need those words of encouragement to be faithful, to just take the next step. William Barclay, uh, a commentator that is more on the liberal side, uh, 
Uh, he was one who believed that the miracle of, of uh, feeding the 5,000 was really just a, a miracle of everybody sharing their lunch. Uh, uh, and that Jesus, when he walked on water, he knew where the rocks were, that, that mentality. But he also had some great devotional thoughts. You see, you can learn some things from all kinds of theologians. You don't have to embrace everything people believe. You need to know what you believe, and you stand on the Word. But Barclay said this, one of the highest of human duties is the duty of encouragement. It is easy to pour cold water on their enthusiasm. It is easy to discourage others. The world is full of discouragers. We have a Christian duty to encourage one another. That's what we need. That's what every believer needs. I don't care if you're a leader. You need to be encouraged. I don't care if you're a follower. You need to be encouraged. I don't care if you're a new believer or a mature believer. You need to be encouraged. John Powell, in his work, Fully Human, Fully Alive, tells the story of a man who made by hand... Uh, a sailboat that he wanted to sail around the world. And as he got ready to launch, a crowd of people surrounded him. And there was one crowd that said, you won't make it. That craft will not handle the tough seas. You, you better go back to the drawing board. You'll die. And then there was another group that went to the pier and shouted words of affirming encouragement. Bon voyage. We're with you. We're proud of you. Keep on keeping on. Sail on. We're praying for you. Let me ask you a question. Which of the two crowds do you think you would be? Would you be there trying to heckle? Uh, and to give words of discouragement? Or would you be one who would be applauding and encouraging? I don't know about you, but I would want to be in the encouraging crowd. Too many people are being discouraged all around the world. But you and I need to be a body of Christ who not only strengthens other people, but encourages other people. Well, then there's another thing this passage teaches us that every believer needs. We need to be strengthened. We need to be, say it out loud, encouraged. And then we need to be organized. We need to be organized. And that's what Paul and Barnabas helped the early churches do. They, they helped them get organized. The Bible says they appointed elders. Wow. We are doomed without leadership. We really are. And leadership is doomed when they don't have a plan, when they don't have a plan. Now, Scripture is not real clear, I need to tell you, uh, whether they were voted on or they were just appointed uh, as the leaders. I would say probably it leans more to they were appointed. However, the, the church, you need to hear this, the early church was doctrinally sound but it was also organizationally very flexible. There are some churches that are doctrinally unsound and organizationally inflexible, but the early church, they kind of went with the flow of organization, but they had organization, but they were doctrinally strong. Now, the key to all of this is that we need to be personally organized. When you've heard it said, that if we pl uh, fail to plan, then we plan to fail. And that's exactly right. I'll never forget where I was on July 20th, 1969. Remember that day? That was the day that Armstrong took a step on the moon. It was one man everybody was focused on and his words. However, do you know that it took 218,000 to put him up there. That's organization. One man may have stepped foot on the moon, 
but it took over 200,000 to get him all the way up there. And I will tell you, after being pastor of that area around the Kennedy Space Center, I know how engineers think, and they're proud of their organization, and they are detailed about all of their plans. I'll never forget having uh, the, the privilege of going with the director of NASA security on one of the launches, one of the shuttle launches into the uh, control area. And he said, let me, let me show you something. We have contingent plans. If the shuttle goes up and it doesn't fully make orbit and we have alternate landing plans and locations that are ready right now. They had details left and right. They love notebooks. They love the organization of details, one, two, three, four. I mean, that's how engineers think, and that was important. In fact, they had organization, and the early church needed organization too, just like we do. Mystics say, well, it'll just happen. Well, let me tell you something. Sometimes things just happen, and God's in charge, but let me tell you something, most of the time, God uses people with a plan. You know what uh, W.T. Connor, a great theologian of yesteryear, once said? The Holy Spirit has an affinity toward the trained mind. That's critical to remember. God wants us to have a plan. You know, most businesses, it's been said, don't have a problem with making a profit but some don't have a plan to do so. Some businesses don't have, uh, well, most businesses don't have a plan uh, with growing, but many don't have a plan to do so. Organization, quite frankly, needs to get more than one in heaven. And it's going to take a lot of people to get a lot of people in heaven. I can't reach everybody. You can't reach everybody. But together, we can make an impact. God uses all kinds of people. Do you understand that? But there must be uh, an understanding that the early church was organized, and it's the church's responsibility to see that their people are organized. Do you know that that is my number one responsibility? According to Ephesians 4.12, the Bible says this very clearly, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. So literally, a pastor teacher is to help equip God's people to do the work of the ministry. And therefore, that ministry is shared with all of us. I can't do it all by myself. You can't do it all by yourself. But all of us can do a little bit together, and that's our purpose. Our focus is to build people up, to equip them to do the work of ministry. You know, I, I watch uh, how our church has morphed over the last several years, and uh, I'm excited about it. I've been... Uh, uh, offering opportunities for uh, some of our pastors to learn to preach, and you have applauded them and strengthened them and encouraged them as they have done so, and you have encouraged them. Man, uh, a lot of times when our uh, associates preach, you applaud them. <laughs> and I'm grateful that you do. Uh, and I, I, every time I hear that, and by the way, if I'm not here, I'm always watching online. I, I am. I'm wanting to know if you are in your particular seat. <laughs> but that's powerful. That's what the church is to be like. All of us need that. We literally need to be organized. Are you? Do you have an organizational plan in your life? That's critical. The early church had that. You and I need to understand that's biblical. But there is another thing that I would share with you, but I don't have time. You've been a real slow class this morning, and I've had to take it easy. 
but we know where we're going to go next time we come together. But let me tell you something. The greatest thing is the body of Christ that will strengthen you, encourage you, and help you to be organized. Let me ask you a question about organization. Is your spiritual life in order? I mean, is it? First of all, have you ever had a one-time experience where you've turned from sin and placed your faith in Christ? That's number one. It's not about being baptized or sprinkled or dunked or whatever. Have you given your life to Christ? I never take for granted every time I stand up here to preach that everybody who's hearing me, whether online or by television or present, has actually turned from sin and placed their faith in Christ. That's number one. Have you done that? Have you done that? Can you remember the moment that you did that? You may not remember the exact day or hour, as some can, but you will know in your knower that you turned from sin and placed your faith in Christ. If you don't, you need to deal with that today, right now. In a moment, I'm going to give an invitation. I want to invite you to come and give your life to Christ. And I pray you'd make a beeline down here and someone will help you be able to pray to receive Jesus and settle that first in organization. Second of all, you need to be baptized. In the Bible, the Scripture talks about baptism. It always occurs after someone prays to receive Jesus. Is your baptism in order? Is it organized? Maybe you got baptized as an infant. Wonderful. That was kind of like a baby dedication for you from your parents. But scripturally, baptism is always after you give your life to Christ. Is that in order? Are you organized? Are you connected to other believers? Are you involved with other believers? Are you in a small group where you are learning how to pray, where you're learning how to share your faith, where you're learning how to walk with Jesus. That is critical for our lives. Are you organized? Or are you just one of those believers who comes on Sunday morning and just sits and soaks, and then it's easy to get sour when you do that. God wants there to be fresh water flowing through your life. He doesn't want you to be like the Dead Sea. It has no outlet. He wants you to be a man, a woman who's in love with him, and your life is fresh every morning because you're spending time with him. Is your spiritual life organized? If not, I pray that today you would make a commitment to get things in order. Thanks for watching Higher Aim with Dr. Kurt Dodd. Visit higheraim.org for more free resources. There, you can access our daily devotions, sign up for our monthly teaching letter, even download the Higher Aim app, and so much more. Just go to higheraim.org to get started.